Well, good morning. Welcome to Harmony Baptist Church. We're glad that you've joined us today for this video worship service. I trust that you're staying cool in all the heat that we're experiencing. We look forward to worshiping together today. I uh, invite you just to wherever you are uh, to enter into the singing, either in spirit or with your mouth, and uh, enjoy the, the time of worship that we have prepared for you. Uh, we will be participating in communion a little later in the service, and so if uh, you want to take the time, if you have not already done so, uh, to prepare bread and wine or juice uh, so that we can share in the Lord's Supper together. Let's worship together. skies proclaim God you reign your glory shines you teach the sun when to bring a new day creation saves God you reign God you reign God, you reign forever and ever. God, you reign. You part the seas. You move the mountains with the words that you say. My song remains. God, you reign. I worship you, 
I worship you. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Even when I can't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I can't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I can't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel that you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker. Promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, 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 that is who you Hey. 
church will sing how great is our God name above all names you are worthy of all praise my heart will sing how great is our God how great is our God sing with me how great is our God and all will see how great how great is our God see how great, how great is our God. Well, this past week, in the midst of all the heat that we're experiencing, we began a project uh, at our home, pouring a driveway and patio. And uh, it didn't start out great thought I'd share a little story with you as we begin. Uh, as we were excavating the driveway, um, I was pitching uh, some of the pieces of asphalt that had been torn up uh, into a, a bin out front. And uh, one of those pieces of asphalt broke apart as I was throwing it, and a piece of it uh, overshot the bin and bounced off the pavement and hit my neighbor's car. I went over and looked and uh, I realized that I had dented his car. Um, I had a dilemma. A at first glance, the dent was very minor, very small. It didn't look like there was much of a mark and I thought perhaps my neighbor wouldn't notice. I feared going and meeting this neighbor uh, who I hadn't met before. They were fairly new to our community. And uh, I feared what he would say. I feared the additional expense that would be there uh, to fix this car. I didn't know how he would react or what he would want done. And, uh, and I was embarrassed. I, I was, I was uh, not looking forward to uh, having to humble myself and admit my mistake, uh, either to my neighbor or to my wife. It was only a dilemma for a minute. Um, I really didn't have a choice. I knew that I needed to go and talk to my neighbor right away and let him know what had happened. And he was very gracious about it. Um, and it certainly felt good to um, get that out and, uh, and have the discussion about it. But it introduces a concept that I, I think is important for us as a church, and that is uh, to spend the summer looking at the nature of character, at what the, the character traits that are necessary in an effective follower of Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about personality, those things that you were born with. I'm not talking about spiritual gifts, the things uh, born in you of the Spirit, but rather I'm talking about the qualities that are nurtured and developed and disciplined within you by your choices and attitudes and responses to life as it happens. John Wooden writes, be more concerned with your character than your reputation, because your character is what you really are, while your reputation is merely what others think you are. And Ruth Barton writes that we set up young leaders for a fall when we encourage them to envision what they can do before they consider the kind of person they should be. So this summer, we're going to spend some time looking at a number of character traits that are essential for the follower of Jesus Christ. 
One of the most important aspects of godly character is humility. God emphasizes it more than any other character trait in the scriptures, except love. It's the most underrated trait, but perhaps the greatest indicator of how far a person will go in life. Spiritual humility is not just thinking less of myself than others. It's not having low self-esteem or a low opinion of myself. True humility is the freedom of not thinking about myself one way or the other at all. No one exemplifies the definition of humility more than the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. We read in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11, You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. In 1 Peter chapter 5, we read that God opposes the proud but that he gives grace to the humble. We're called to clothe ourselves with humility. We are to relate to others in such a way that we always value them above ourselves. Can you imagine a world in which everyone just tried to outserve one another? Not only are we to relate to each other with humility, but we're reminded that there's no quicker way to put ourselves in opposition with God than to be proud. God is not against the weak or the poor, the hurting. He is against the proud. He takes care of the humble and is opposed to the proud. Humility is about self-awareness. If you see yourself for who you are and embrace it honestly, then humility is the natural result. Our humility invites and allows God to act on our behalf. The word humility comes from humus, uh, which means earth or dirt, as compared to hummus, which is a Middle Eastern food made from chickpeas. I like hummus, but I like hummus better, because humility is so important for each one of us as a follower of Jesus. If pride puffs you up and causes you to desire to be seen as bigger than you are, then humility is when you're down to earth, wasting no energy on pretension. Humility means you don't look down on anyone. You don't see anyone or anything as being beneath you. Humility is one of humanity's most elusive and attractive characteristics. It's so rare that when we find it in others, we're attracted to it, we're drawn to it. Humility not only draws others close, but it apparently draws God close as well. It's so important that God takes notice when someone walks in it. In the Bible, in Numbers chapter 12, verse 3, we read that Moses was very humble, more humble than any other person on earth. Well, if that's true, if he was more humble than anyone else, and if humility is an essential character trait, then perhaps we should look a little bit more at his story to just determine what we can learn. Well, apparently, he didn't start that humble. In Genesis chapter 2, uh, we read the story of Moses and how he was an Israelite baby, uh, born while the Israelites were slaves uh, in Egypt. And to make a long story short, Pharaoh's daughter raised him uh, as a prince of Egypt, this little Hebrew baby. He would have been raised to be, to be proud, to be strong, uh, to rule. He, he was given a great education. Uh, he knew how to speak. He apparently knew his heritage really well. And when he had grown up, he went to visit his own people. 
he witnessed how they were forced to work. When he saw an Egyptian beating one of his fellow Hebrews, he decided to take matters into his own hands. The Bible says that he looked in all directions to make sure that no one was watching, and then he killed the Egyptian and hid the body in the sand. He acted out of pride. He believed he should rule, that he was in charge, and so he took matters into his own hand. The next day, he witnessed two Hebrews fighting and asked the instigator why they were fighting. The man questioned Moses' authority and asked if he was going to kill him the way he had the Egyptian the day before. Moses was afraid, thinking that everyone uh, knew what he had done. And sure enough, Pharaoh heard uh, what had happened and tried to put Moses to death. And so Moses fled. He fled for his life. He went to Midian and spent 40 years there. He went from prince to refugee. Here's a few lessons from that opening scene. First of all, beware when you think you're getting away with something, because sin has a way of being exposed. And secondly, don't trust in your position or your influence, because it might not be as secure as you think it is. People have a way of turning on you when supporting you no longer benefits them. And thirdly, what you have can be gone in an instant. If you think you are secure and you look down on those in a lower position, realize that you can be lowered from your position very quickly. In Luke chapter 14, verse 11, Jesus sets forth a powerful principle of life. He says, For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, literally put down, and he who humbles himself will be exalted, will be lifted up. If I push myself up, God will push me down. And if I humble myself, God will lift me up. So Moses goes to live in the land of Midian. He ends up marrying a woman there while living as a foreigner in the land. He has children. Uh, and years pass. But Pharaoh dies. And when Pharaoh dies, his son continues to enslave the people of Israel. They cry out to God for help, and he hears them. And God appears to Moses in the form of, of a burning bush. Moses is amazed because even though this bush is on fire, even though it's engulfed in flame, it isn't burned up. God calls to Moses from the middle of the bush. Moses, being invited to approach, feels unworthy. God commands Moses to return to Egypt to lead the Israelites to freedom. And this is where we learn that Moses has been humbled by his 40 years in exile. Moses is a far different man than he was when he fled Egypt. Listen as I read from Exodus chapter 3. But Moses protested to God, Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? God answered, I will be with you, and this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. But Moses protested, If I go to the people of Israel and tell them, The God of your ancestors has sent me, they will ask me, What is his name? And what shall I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. And then in Exodus chapter 4, uh, beginning at verse 10, but Moses pleaded with the Lord, O oh Lord, I'm not very good with words. I never have been, and I'm not now. Even though you have spoken to me, I get tongue-tied and my words get tangled. Then the Lord asked Moses, Who makes a person's mouth? Who decides whether people speak or do not speak, hear or do not hear, see or do not see? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. I will be with you as you speak, 
and I will instruct you in what you say. But Moses again pleaded, Lord, please send anyone else. Moses is a far different man from this strong prince of Egypt. He now knows that in and of himself, he does not have the strength to do what God asks. He knows that he is no match for Pharaoh. It seems hard to be believe, but God is not as impressed by talent and ability as much as he is by character. God chooses to work through Moses now, in this situation, when he's a nobody, instead of when Moses was in a position of influence and power in Egypt 40 years prior. Perhaps the reason for so much of the conflict that often occurs within churches is that people are moved to positions of prominence and power because of their skill and their success, regardless of their character. God can only use us if we are genuinely humble. Humility is recognizing that in and of ourselves, we can accomplish nothing of value. It's only God working in and through us that allows us to make a difference. You see, Moses in this story isn't saying that, that he can't say anything, that he can't speak, he can't do anything. What he's saying is that he knows now that in his own strength, in his own ability, he is no match for Pharaoh. But God is saying, because you are humble, I will be with you and I will make this happen. Humility is a necessary character trait for each one of us. It's the door that opens the way to all the other character traits. Because humility is required if we are to bow ourselves before God, uh, if we are to humble ourselves before God and to invite God to work in our lives, to invite God to form us and shape us and use us. What's the end of the story? Well, Moses and his brother Aaron Return to Egypt, they confront Pharaoh, and eventually the Israelites are allowed to go free, beginning the journey to the promised land. God was with Moses, just as he said he was, and Moses led his people all the way to the promised land. Well, what about you? Do you want God to be with you and to use you? If so, then you need to humble yourself to submit yourself to God in order to receive all that God has for us, the grace that he has for each one of us, all that is required is for us to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, to bow before him, to submit to his will for our lives, to acknowledge that it's not about what we want, it's about what God wants. If you're still negotiating with God, then I don't think you've come to a place of humility. You haven't realized what it is that God wants to do in your life. Humility begins by emptying yourself of self. It's a coming to God without an agenda and without negotiation. If you're still negotiating with God, then you haven't yet found the path of humility. We read this morning that in humility, Jesus submitted himself to his Father, even when it led to a cross. And if we're to live where God lives, then we must do the same. We must submit to our Lord, humbling ourselves before him. The very act of communion is an acknowledgement that we are not self-sufficient. In humility, we come to Christ to receive his body and his blood made available to us by his grace. Communion reminds us that we are needy. It reminds us of our place as recipients of grace. Will you join me in participating 
in the Lord's Supper right now. We read in the Bible that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Will you eat bread now? Reminding yourself that without the sacrifice of Jesus, you are nothing at all. You are totally dependent on him. Let's eat together. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. When we drink from this cup, we are reminded that we are dependent on the blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. We are dependent on the blood of Jesus for our status and standing before God. Let's drink together with thanksgiving. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the humility of Christ, for his example as he went to the cross for us, how he was faithful even to the cross because of his love. For us and because of his submission to you. God, may we too be humble enough to admit that we need you, that there is nothing we can do in our own strength, that we are totally dependent on you for all that we need to do in life and for who we are in life. God, continue to form our character May we be disciples of Jesus, followers of the way, those who stand in the gap and make a difference until Christ comes again. In Jesus' name, amen. deep your grace is more where grace is found is where you are and where you are Lord I am free holiness is Christ in me and where you are Lord I Yeah.
my righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. As we close our service, let me leave you with these words from 2 Peter chapter 5. God opposes the proud, but favors the humble. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. Go in peace. Amen.